Hello, this is Dr. Dennis Bielfeldt of the Christ School of Theology. You're watching a series of lectures right now uh, on Aquinas, and we're looking at Aquinas' sort of philosophical uh, understandings, and we're doing this in a very general way. Uh, this is not a deep uh, understanding or exploration or an investigation of Thomas's uh, of philosophy. Because, of course, Thomas was a very, very good philosopher and a very uh, astute interpreter of Aristotle, actually. Uh, people are finding that out more and more. As Thomas uh, comes uh, out now and is looked at, not through the eyes of a certain kind of uh, 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 schoolman tradition, but uh, as a uh, figure in his own right. Anyway, uh, some very general things here. Uh, I've been talking about the Neoplatonic uh, orientation of Thomas's thought. And sometimes, in fact, Thomas has been called uh, an existentialist. Well, he's not an existentialist. Uh, I don't want you to think about Sartre or Heidegger. Of course, Heidegger claimed he wasn't an existentialist either, of course. He was an ontologist. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, the reason why someone would say uh, he's an existentialist is, of course, he's dealing with existence. Uh, Particularly, as uh, God is uh, full uh, to be ness, right, uh, for uh, Thomas. And uh, this to be ness, if you take to be ness and you lop off particular ways that the to be ness could be, if you take to be ness, essa, and subtract essentia, you get a being. This is a bit like determinate negation, if you've heard of this notion. Uh, you take a white uh, board like this, and I can put a, f a few marks up on this, and whatever is left over at the end is what is uh, what I've made out of this uh, uh, white board, haven't I? Essa is to be -ness in its depth. If you finitize essa by essentia, you get a finite being ends. And that's very Neoplatonic. So no, Thomas is not an existentialist, but he certainly understands that in God, uh, there is an identity of uh, essence and existence, right? God is pure to be -ness, and there is no limitation in God. Thomas thinks of being platonically, the highest being, God, is that in which all things participate. And of course, as we've talked about before, uh, one can also think of this as the actus purus, uh, considered from the Aristotelian perspective. He uses the emanationalist uh, model. He quotes uh, Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite uh, many times in the Summa Theologica. Uh, the world is an overflow of God. The first God cause, of course, is above any particular ens, any particular being. And uh, if the first cause uh, is above any particular being, and we think of this as essa, right? And ens participates in essa, and in that way is a cause. Uh, we really can't say what God is. Uh, because to, to say what God is would be, in some sense, to negate the essa in a particular way, is to finitize it in a certain way, right? Uh, when you are staring at pure being, which is no thing in particular, right, pure being, uh, words have difficulty uh, describing the character of something that is in and of itself undifferentiable, not differentiated. Uh, so what Thomas uh, understands is that while we can say certain things of God, we're not making literal statements about God. God is Essa, okay, and uh, this pure beingness is uh, infinity. And as we take words and we try to apply it to this, we might use words like good, 
and truth and power and maybe beauty. And these are all words that get after this simplicity of God. Uh, they get after that, but they don't literally describe the constitution of God. Now, of course, Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite opted here for the via negativa, right? The via negativa, that when confronted with God, we, we literally can't say anything of God because if we say something of God, we are saying what God is not, right? Yeah, it should be an A. Nobody would end in a Latin phrase like that with an I, right? It's going to be via negativa. Uh, now, of course, he was not an advocate of the via positiva. The via positiva thinks that we can say certain things about God uh, because God is the kind of thing that can be said. And, of course, uh, enlightenment notions of God, uh, God is... Uh, uh, a being with some total of all the positive predicates to the infinite degree. Uh, you can say things about God. That would be part of the via positiva. What our good friend uh, Aris, uh, Aquinas does is he rejects the via positiva, but he understands we have to say something about God. Uh, we can't just be silent in the face of God. So he talks about a via eminencia, Eminencia, eminencia. Yeah, that's what I want to say. A via eminencia. While we, while one can predicate God positively, properly speaking, God is beyond predication. But God is more like being good than being evil, more like being true than being false, more like having power than not having power. So we're, what we're doing is we're characterizing God through the doctrine of analogical predication. Thus, while we cannot literally think God, we can't affirm him. God gives goodness to all things. Okay? And thus we can say that God is good, even though they, the goodness that God has is beyond our categories of good and, and evil, if you will. Okay, now... Uh, this essa, of course, we have something going on here as well. Uh, this is sometimes called the conversion of being and goodness, right? Uh, to a degree that something has being, it is good. And to something, uh, degree something is good, it has being. God has being a holy, complete being. So God is good although not in the way we talk about good, but it is good in some sense. And this goodness of God then overflows into creation, if you will. Everything participates in God. So God gives goodness to all things. And what is evil then? Well, let's go back to our good friend Augustine, right? Evil is the absence of good. Evil is the failure of a thing to be deeply itself, right? That's very Neoplatonic. Remember as we talked about uh, Augustine, and we talked about Boethius, evil is the failure of a thing to be deeply itself. So sin works against the natural drive of creation to self-fulfillment and actualization. Marvelous. God gives to all things their perfection their perfection, now this is, a, a, we have to understand perfection is their completion, right? Their proper talos is their completion. So the perfection of the acorn is the oak tree, right? So God gives to all things their perfection, their proper talos. The world is a cosmos of things developing into themselves. See, this is an exciting view of things, very sacramental notion of reality, isn't it? One's nature is its law of development. The nature of a thing is its law of development, its trajectory of actualizing its talos. The word there, talos, of course, in Greek is end, right? 
Knowledge is the talos of human beings. So growth in knowledge is self-fulfillment. Growth in knowledge is self-fulfillment. It is growth in being. It is an overcoming of the deficiencies within fallen existence. You know, God delights in being. This is God's nature to the delight in his being. To the delight in being. Because all being comes from him. Since God is being in its fullness, God delights in himself, right? And of course, for Aristotle, God is thought thinking itself. What must God do? Well, think the highest thing. Well, it's the highest thing. Well, God, so God thinks himself. God delights in himself. God's delight in himself transforms itself into natural law. That is the law apprehended by all human beings. And so natural law is a very important category for Thomas. So uh, this Neoplatonic influence I've been talking about, human beings participate in the delight of the world, and they thus participate in God. Aquinas holds that all things participate in the archetype which is God. He synthesizes this Neoplatonic notion with the Aristotelian idea, the Octus Pyrrhus. And this Neoplatonism, however, that we find in Thomas wanes after Thomas. So Thomas is here, you know, he's got Aristotle worked in and uh, with the Neoplatonic tradition, and so you still have this wonderful sacramental notion of reality. But after Thomas, this kind of thinking wanes. So the presupposition of Christian thinking for the last thousand years is eclipsed after Thomas. Okay? Aristotle wins. Aristotle's worldview wins out over Plato, and the world is forever changed. And we'll be talking about that when we get to Duns Scotus. Thank you. This is Dr. Dennis Bielfeld of the Christ School of Theology. See you soon.